All right, so for the sake of the recording, I'll just say we're starting a new series tonight. Uh, that'll take us up to June. That's uh, a series that explores um, the spiritual journey with God and things that we can anticipate, uh, gives us language for naming our experiences and um, uh, provides some perspectives on the milestones that are part of this journey. So we're, we're looking at some of the language in Psalms uh, on this journey or path that we take with God. Uh, we see it turn up several times in Proverbs, like Proverbs 4. Let your eyes look directly forward and your gaze be straight before you. Ponder the path of your feet. Then all your ways will be sure. You know, this, this call to consider, to, um, to uh, meditate on the path of, of our feet. Do not soar to the right or to the left. Turn your foot away from evil. And then uh, we see this come up again and again in the prophets. So Isaiah chapter two, <clears throat> this great prophecy, it shall come to pass in the latter days that the mountain of the house of the Lord shall be established as the highest of the mountains and shall be lifted up above the hills and all the nations shall flow to it. And many peoples shall come and say, come, let us go up to the mountain of the Lord the house of the God of Jacob, that he may teach us his ways and that we may walk in his paths. So all of that just to sort of reestablish in our minds that life with God is uh, a journey. It involves a path. And uh, what we're doing in this short series is exploring um, some of the things that we find along that path. So uh, just to continue to get us thinking in this uh, regard, let's think about um, uh, maybe more literal paths. Uh, so I'd, I'd, I'd like uh, one or two of you uh, describe the path you took to get to some place recently. Um, if, if Scott was here, I'd ask him to describe the path to Hawaii. Um, but th this could be a path anywhere. It could be to the grocery store. It could be to some place you visited recently. Uh, what was the destination? What might someone expect who's never made the journey? So how would you describe that path to someone maybe who's never gone there? What were the milestones that you encountered on that path? What were the highs and lows? How did you measure progress? Uh, so let's just have one or two share um, answers to those questions as it relates to a, a, a real literal physical path that you took to a, a, an actual destination recently and how you might describe some of those things you know, to someone who, who had not made that journey with you. I have a moderately entertaining one. I made a journey from the Allen Pavilion emergency department room a week ago, Wednesday night at about 1 a.m. in the morning um, to the Harkness Pavilion downtown. Um, two very pleasant young, young, young compared to me, men came in, helped me gather up my stuff, strapped me down, loaded me in a wagon, a panel van, drove me and I could just barely see out the window um, through down, down Broadway, I think, um, but I wasn't sure. It was a strange sensation. I thought I was going down Broadway to the Harkness Pavilion down at the big hospital. And I, I won't, the rest of the journey is entertaining, but, but too long for this setting, so. That was a recent journey I took, a uh, path um, that was interesting to me. Mm, yeah. So there was some uncertainty involved in it. Mm -hmm. um, it involved other people who were making the journey with you. Mm -hmm. You got to your destination. You arrived at your destination. I did. Yeah. Good. Thank you, Jane. Mm -hmm. Someone else. I'll tell about my journey. It's not quite as dramatic as Jane. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
But uh, so we left here a week ago today and drove to uh, Elkton, Maryland and went uh, down the Jersey Turnpike, of course. And one of the things that happened along there, we did see a fairly, uh, an accident that didn't look, it looked pretty bad. Little boy out on the road um, with people over him. And then we just barely got by and then the ambulances were coming the other way. And then when we look backwards, the traffic had been stopped. So I think we just barely uh, got by the accident. And then the next day we drove to Washington DC and picked up a friend at Dulles Airport. And that was interesting because Dulles Airport is just filled with people from every place in the world. So it's kind of interesting to sit there and watch them while we're waiting for our friend. And then we meandered on down to Culpeper to Rapidan, Virginia, to this farm where our friends live. And um, that was about it, except it was a very pleasant, beautiful day, both days that we were traveling and it was um, nice weather and the traffic really light. So we considered it a very positive journey. Hmm. Good, thank you, Sylvia. So uh, there's a little bit of danger on a journey like that. Um, several stages to it. Um, you didn't do it all at once, but there were some stops and starts. Uh, other people involved with you on that journey, some beauty uh, to the journey that you enjoyed and, and you reached your destination. Right. Good, thank you. All right, so uh, what we're doing in this class then is sort of asking similar questions as it relates to the spiritual journey, our life with God. How do we how do we know where we're headed or supposed to be headed in the Christian spiritual journey? What milestones might we expect on the path? What difficulties could we expect? How do we measure progress on that path? Uh, these would these would all be questions that uh, we'll sort of touch on over the next few weeks. Um, I'm using two books here, uh, the content from two books uh, to to answer these questions for us. Uh, one is called The Critical Journey by Janet Hagberg and Robert Gulick. And in their book, they describe the, the spiritual journey with God as having seven stages. So there's actually six stages and something they call the wall. And so seven in total. And we're going to kind of walk through those seven stages and, and just reflect on them uh, as, as our own journey finds uh, similarities or dissimilarities from them. And then the other is a book called Spiritual Formation by Henry Nouwen, where he describes the spiritual journey as having seven movements or seven polarities or uh, seven tensions. <clears throat> and what's nice about using these two books is they're, they're very different ways of thinking about our journey with God and Christ. Um, the critical journey is, is what's called a stage-based model. So there are uh, distinct stages that we move through in uh, sequential order. And uh, there's a very clear uh, final stage that we're moving toward. Uh, we, we may or may not reach it fully in this lifetime, but um, it gives us a, a sense of progression. So we're making progress when we know we've, we've moved from one stage to another. And it gives us some sense of the milestones, what we can expect. You know, let's say we're in stage three, but as we look ahead to four, five, six, and the wall, we, we have some sense, even though we've not made that journey yet, we have some sense of what might lie ahead for us uh, on the path. The book by Henry Nowen, Spiritual Formation, <clears throat> is different because it's, it is not stage-based. Um, it's a series of tensions or movements, as Nowen calls them, that, uh, are, that stay with us no matter where we are in the journey. Um, sometimes we may feel some resolution to one movement, but then there's another movement where we're really wrestling with, but all seven 
of these movements are uh, a long-term part of our journey with Christ. And um, sort of the comfort of Nouwen's way of thinking about the spiritual journey is that you don't have to, um, you don't have to feel bad if you haven't finished a stage or if you're not in stage six versus stage three. Uh, we're constantly dealing with these polarities or tensions and, and that's okay. So we're going to look at all uh, these two groups of seven, the seven stages in the critical journey and the seven movements or polarities in uh, Henry Nowen's book. And ultimately, uh, my hope is that they'll give you some new language and paradigms for understanding your past and your present experiences of God. And they'll give you a little glimpse of uh, maybe what to look for in the future. <clears throat> All right, so a few, for a few nights, we're going to be in uh, the critical journey, and I've, I've sort of uh, added to uh, some of this content with some content of my own. What you see on the right is uh, the full uh, model for them of the Christian journey. So there are six stages, and in between stage four and five, you see uh, uh, something called the wall, and we'll, we'll talk about all six of these stages. Uh, we might hit stages one and two tonight, but it moves from uh, stage one, uh, recognition of God. Essentially, when we enter into uh, awareness of God, relationship with God, there's some intention on our part to, to, um, to be with God, to what they call a life of discipleship, to the productive life, to a, a journey inward, and then a, a, a wall. Uh, which is maybe one of the most helpful parts of their journey, of, of their model. And stage five is, is moving back outward again, having uh, encountered the wall. And then stage six is the life of love. So for uh, Hagberg and Gulick, the best way to think about the destination of the Christian life is, is a life of love. And um, that's helpful. It fits in really well with, with, what we've been talking about in terms of learning to live a life of love. Let me say a few things just in general about this model of uh, the Christian journey. So the authors say that uh, these stages are fluid and uh, cum cumulative. So we, we may experience some movement back and forth. You know, let's say we've gotten to stage three some things may happen in a life that sort of push us back to stage two. And, and that's okay. There is a bit of fluidity in uh, the progress here. And we, we might experience more than one stage at one time, especially stages that we've already gone through, but we do move, move through them in sequence. So in, in their way of thinking, we wouldn't go from stage one to stage four without moving through stage two and stage three. And, and each of these stages sort of builds on the other. And there are certain things that need to be placed in our life for us to experience a successful movement from one stage to another. Number two, uh, the authors talk about what they call a home stage and uh, revisiting that stage. So, uh, even though there is some fluidity and some movement back and forth, they say, uh, depending on what season of life that we're in, all of us will have a, a home stage, a, a stage that we're, we're in fairly regularly and that tends to uh, shape the way that we experience life with God in that season of life. The authors talk about what they call cages. So it is possible to get stuck in one of these stages. And I, I think that'll become fairly clear tonight, especially as we talk about stage two. But there, there are a number of things that can bog us down that can keep forward progress from happening. And uh, it's important to figure out why that is and what to do uh, to move forward in the journey. And then uh, the authors describe these stages as sort of inner and outer. So stages one, two, and three, recognition of God, life of discipleship, and the productive life. 
are uh, stages where our relationship with God is, is largely experienced and expressed in external ways as, as we're sort of learning the path and getting used to walking with God. And then stages four, five, and six are really where the, uh, our faith, our walk with God gets internalized. And so that's why it begins in stage four with the, the journey inward. Um, faith, we really, we, we, we really begin to own our faith at that point. Uh, fifth, just general comments again, uh, crisis, a time for moving. Uh, sometimes crisis uh, moments in our life are what provide the energy for moving from one stage to another. Um, the wall, which we'll talk about in two or three Wednesday nights, is, is a moment of, of intense crisis. But there are other smaller crises that may take place in our life that help us move from one to two, from two to three, three to four. And then there are some similarities. Uh, stage two, a life of discipleship. And stage five, the journey outward, uh, are, are similar in that there's sort of an expansion of our faith and our walk with God as it, as it moves outward. Uh, to consider the people in the world around us. Stages three and six are, are very similar. Stage three, they call the productive life. This is where we start using our talents and our gifts and ministry and service uh, to others. And uh, stage six is where uh, that productive life moves into uh, a, a new and deeper level as um, uh, the, the motive for uh, loving God and, and others becomes more internalized and, and our entire life is given over to uh, stewarding the gifts and opportunities that we have to bless others. So those are just some general comments about the model. Um, so what we'll uh, try to do tonight is uh, jump into stage one and stage two. <clears throat> uh, almost without doubt, these are stages that all of us have moved beyond. And so the purpose of spending some time in stage one and stage two tonight would be to reflect on what our experiences are, um, see if some of this language is helpful for naming that experience, and really to, to consider how our experiences in these two stages still shape uh, the way we experience life with God today. Everybody hanging in there? Okay. I, I, I do have some questions in here, so we'll we'll get back to conversation. <clears throat> All right, so stage one, uh, this is chapters one, two, and three in the critical journey. Uh, you don't have to purchase those books at all, uh, but if uh, you know you're one of those people that loves books and you get a copy, this this comes from the first three chapters. So the summary of of the first stage, uh, there's a childlike and fresh recognition of the reality or presence of someone, God, who stands behind it all. Uh, it's a time we may frequently long for again later in our relationship with God. We will probably look back on the stage with fondness, uh, with, with uh, some um, sentimentality. One of the great contributions, I think, of, of this model is they say that people generally enter into a relationship with God in stage one uh, for, for one of two different uh, reasons, um, a sense of awe and a sense of need. Uh, so let's, let's kind of dig into that. So we'll look, at, we'll look at some characteristics of this stage. We'll look at uh, cages, you know, some of the things that, that cause people to kind of get stuck in this stage. And uh, we'll look at some of the things that are helpful in moving from stage one to stage two. So one of the things that the, the authors spend quite a bit of time on is exploring uh, how people or why people enter into a relationship with God. And uh, they summarize it with these two words, that, that some come into relationship with God through a sense of awe. You know, something happens in their life where, where they're impressed with, with someone, God, who, who is larger than themselves. Uh, perhaps they have experiences of awe in their life, like the birth of a child or recovery from illness or, or even the loss of a loved one, 
but but there's this uh, sense of wow, uh, of holiness, of transcendence, uh, that that there is some supreme being, some supreme power behind it all. That's that's what awe is. And then uh, the rest, uh, in, in their way of thinking about it, the rest come to, to relationship with God out of a sense of need. So there's some pain in their life. They're looking for divine help with it. And that leads them into relationship with God. They're dealing with physical illness and they're seeking healing. And so they enter into relationship with God. They have some grief that they're dealing with loneliness, um, a, a, some experience of being rejected. And so they turn to God. So there's, there's these two broad motives that, that tend to initiate people's relationship with God. One, one is a sense of awe and the other is a sense of need. All right, so let's just stop right there and, and talk about those two things. Do, do either of those, a sense of awe or a sense of need, represent um, some of the major, major reasons why you entered into a relationship with God? Um, if not, what would you add? And, and also, how do these still present themselves in your spiritual journey today? So, I, I, Annie, I think you're, you're ready to go there. Um, well, how would you <laughs> You know, it's interesting. I, I, it's talking about recognition of God. And, and I, my first thought is my introduction to God was sort of thrust upon me. I mean, you grow up in um, uh, a faith that you don't, at least I didn't have really a choice in at that moment. And you go through these stages of life as, you know, discipleship and thinking, you know, productive life. And I, I think as you get towards stage four is, um, I think that's where it can actually bring you back to stage one. And if you're talking about a sense of awe or a sense of need, it's, it's when you take it in, you start to take it more personal, personally. And I could see this sort of bounce back between stage four and stage one, um, heading towards the wall and then coming on back. So I think, uh, I think it's a real process that you could spin in that process wheel um, for quite some time. But the good thing about that is as you, each time you revisit stage one, you are more learned, you know, you have more of a, you, you have a greater perspective or you have a multifaceted perspective. Um, so it, it enriches stage two and stage three and even stage four along the way. And at some point you may bust through, um, but again, it, it's, it, to me, it's easy to come back to stage one over and over and over again. Yeah, it's really thought-provoking, Annie. So would you say that um, some of the things that led you initially into relationship with God are, um, I mean, how, how would you describe those things? Were they superficial? Were they, because you, you said they were kind of thrust upon you. Um, yeah. Can you say some more about that? Yeah, so when, so I grew up Catholic, and so my understanding of God, my recognition of what God is in my life, that was... Perhaps especially in my faith, that is something that was given to me that I was to absorb and, and to essentially obey. Um, but as I grew and I started to um, experience life and difficulties in life and difficulties in myself, you know, I started to. So I was living a life of what I thought was discipleship, of what I thought was productive. But as you get towards stage four, that starts getting challenged. And I think that's where you start heading back to, okay, so, well, what is God in my life? How do I need God? How do I wish to have God? How do I, how am I in awe of God? How am I angry with God? Um, so it's that four that bounces back to one and you, you know, you mix it up and you figure out where that sauce leads you. And then you move through the stages again. Um, so I, as I, as I was saying before, I just can see that, one through four and a half happening over and over and over again. And while it can be very frustrating at the same time, it can also be very enriching. And it, and it makes each one of those stages more powerful as, as you move towards past the wall. Yeah, I think that's really helpful, Annie. 
to, um, to give ourselves permission to go back to stage one and, and say, okay, what, what am I doing here? What is this all about? Why, why am I in relationship with God? And, and, and to move back again through those initial stages. I think that's a critical question. Um, so, so stage, one of the things you're pointing out here is that stage one is it's not one and done. Mm. But there, there may be moments in our lives, even for some of us, even in this season of life during COVID, um, there may be moments in our lives where we need to go back to that and, and get some clarity about mm. what is it that has drawn me into relationship with God. Someone else want to comment on, on uh, this, this first characteristic of stage one from your experience? Deb, Debbie? Um, kind of like, like Annie, I'm kind of going back to my childhood um, experiences. And uh, I was thinking the other day, but one of the songs that I think we sang at our little church weekly, if maybe weekly, if not every other week, um, but was trust and obey. Yeah. And we don't tend to use that term. We don't sing that as much anymore. And um, impossible, we don't use that kind of terminology about our relationship to God as one, as, as one of obedience. Um, trust, yes, we talk about that. Um, but as a child, that helped me make sense of the world. It helped me make sense of what I was supposed to be doing in the world. You know, how do I supposed to function? Um, trusting and obeying were things that as a child I could do. And I could, uh, it was a way to be in relationship with God. I didn't think of it as being in relationship with God. It was just, that's what you do. You know, like, like you're a little girl, you go to school and you listen to the teacher and you do what the teacher says to do. You go home and you listen to your parents and you do what your parents tell you to do. And, um, and you're out in the world, God tells you what to do and you do what God tells you to do. It made sense of the world. So I don't, I don't relate really as much to the awe when I think about my childhood or, um, or need, it was just like thrust upon me as this is the way you make sense of the world. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So again, something childlike there, right? I yeah. Mean, mm -hmm. They're it, very it, it made, yeah. It made sense to you as a child. This is, this is what we do. This is the mm -hmm. right thing to do. Mm-hmm. It's also possible that as children, we're in a state of awe all the time and don't know any other state to be in. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think there's something to that. The, the way my brain operates, I'm aware of so many things going on in my life around me at all times, uh, particularly visual, but I, it's, I sense everything all at once. And I've always, I don't know where it started, but I've always had confidence that there was something bigger behind all those things. Uh, uh, and that's why I love the term awesome God, because I, I, you know, I, I can't fathom the power and the love and the creativity behind these things that walk around in my world with me. Uh, and I, I don't know when it started. I and it hasn't stopped. We'll put it that way. It's just been my entire life. Uh, I sort of am breathless at at what I detect around me. Yeah, I love that. Thank you, John. Uh, Art or Julie, I see you guys unmuting yourself. Well, I, I was going to offer a little bit more an upbeat uh, <laughs> view of this, and and mine was uh, what well, I question need. And, you know, thankfully it was, uh, you know, I'll, I'll say some decades ago and, um, you know, my relationships were completely busted. My finances were in a shamble. Um, I felt at the time that life was meaningless and, you know, it, it kind of comes off of the book of Ecclesiastes, but I believe that to be so. I was, I was fatigued and, and I just couldn't, I just couldn't figure my way out of it. And so, you know, in some, in some respects, God was the last resort. So I needed God. Yeah, that's, that's a great example. 
Thank you, Art. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna move forward. We'll stop again and, and talk here. Um, so we're looking at characteristics of stage one. Uh, number two is natural awareness. They suggest that in this these early stages with God, we're not given to thinking about God as much as we are experiencing the presence of God. And so for for some, nature is is part of the initial entree into uh, the spiritual journey. Greater meaning in life. Uh, people are often motivated into relationship with God by a desire to go deeper in some sense or to move beyond the spiritual superficial life to, to find something that has greater meaning in life. Uh, there's a sense of innocence here and maybe De Debbie's comment touches on this. Um, we, we believe the world is all in God's hand. Everybody will love others if they're just given a chance. You know, there's a sense of we, we haven't gone through the, the hard knocks yet with God where, where um, we, we lose some of that innocence. All right, some, some cages, and then uh, I'll walk through the cages and, and ask for comments on these. So cages, these, these are some of the things that might keep someone from moving from that, that early initial relationship with God into stage two, a life of discipleship, which is really learning more about God and, and walking with him, uh, growing deeper in that walk with God. So some of the cages they identify, uh, one they call worthlessness. We can get stuck here when instead of feeling love and all, we think of God and others as constantly having expectations we can't measure up to. So, so if this God we've come into relationship with is, is one that we feel like has unrealistic expectations, I'll never match up to them um, and, and therefore I'm worthless, we're, we're, we're never going to move forward around this circle. We'll, we'll just be stuck there. Uh, number two, spiritual bankruptcy. Uh, we, we can get stuck here when we feel we have no well to draw from. It, it takes energy uh, to, to move through the stages. And so if something happens in that, that initial experience of God that, that sort of saps us, uh, we may not move into stage two. Uh, martyrdom. <clears throat> There, there may be experiences early on where we feel the world is out to make life tough for us. God is out to make life tough for us. We experience anger. And so uh, we're, we're not able to move into uh, stage two. And the last one they mentioned is ignorance. Just we our, our own lack of understanding about the larger journey that we're on, about how faith really works, uh, can kind of keep us stuck. So that even as an adult, we have this very sort of immature, uninformed, uh, way of thinking about God and, and life with God. All right, so let me, let me stop there. Do any of those sort of cages resonate with your experience early on with God? All right, I'll just, oh, go ahead. Arthur. I was just going to say, I'm, I'm a no. <laughs> no. Okay. no. Okay. Thank you. Um, I'll just speak from my own um, experience. I think in some ways, this fourth cage operated in my own life, um, having come out of an unchurched background, come to faith in Christ uh, as a teenager in high school, and um, and then not really having someone around me who could say, hey, here's, here's what this is all about. Let me, let me help you gain a little bit of understanding. But I got that when I got to college and there was sort of this, this um, rapid acceleration through some of the stages when I got to college. But those first couple of years for me, right after I was baptized in high school, you know, it was just sort of um, languishing there. I've, I've been baptized, I've been saved from hell, I, I think I'm probably not going to go to hell, but you know that's kind of kind of it in my relationship with God. What do you think he means by faith can keep us stuck here? Our our lack of understanding about the larger spiritual journey or about faith. Oh, or about faith. faith. I got you. Okay, yeah. I was that's, not reading it correctly. Yeah, okay. yeah. I'm trying to summarize. You know, mm -hmm. 
some of the things we're talking about there. Okay, so uh, the last thing on stage one here, uh, some of the catalysts for moving from stage one to stage two. Again, stage two being what they call the life of discipleship, where we're, we're learning a lot more, we're growing a lot more. <clears throat> so they say two things. Number one, accept your self-worth. Movement requires an acknowledgement that we're basically worthwhile, that we're loved just as we are. And so this means giving up self-defeating behavior and accepting God's love. I, I think the issue that they're touching on there is that um, some of us enter into a relationship with God that's, that's tainted, colored in, in some way, either by life experience or bad religion that, that views God as angry, judgmental, uh, too, too high an expectation, and, and therefore we're worthless. So accepting our self-worth, changing that image of God is, is vital. And, and number two, reduce isolation. Movement from stage one to stage two requires accepting the caring of a community to which you can belong. One of the things that happens in stage two is we, we sort of move from me and God to, uh, to we and God. We, we become part of a larger community of faith that, that helps us to progress uh, in that journey. Um, either, either of those two things resonate with anything early on in your walk with God. Okay, let's jump to stage two. Oh, a couple of examples, forgot, a couple of examples in scripture. Uh, so this, you know, this great scene in Exodus three, Moses was keeping the flock of his father-in-law, Jethro, the priest of Midian, and he led his flock to the west side of the wilderness and came to Horeb, the mountain of God. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. He looked and behold, the bush was burning, yet it was not consumed. And Moses said, I will turn aside to see this great sight, why the bush is not burned. When the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush, Moses, Moses. And he said, here I am. And he said, do not come near. Take your sandals off your feet for the place on which you're standing is holy ground. And he said, I am the God of your father, the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, the God of Jacob. And Moses hid his face for he was afraid to look at God. So I, I think of this in terms of uh, awe. You know, for Moses, there was a real sense of awe that uh, led him deeper into this relationship with God. You know, whether he was in stage one or, or a, a little bit further, um, I think this is a good biblical example here of, of awe, awesomeness, holiness. And then in terms of need, um, we often find people following Jesus initially out of, out of need. So this text in Matthew 20, as they went out of Jericho, a great crowd followed him. And behold, there were two blind men sitting by the roadside. And when they heard that Jesus was passing by, they cried out, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. The crowd rebuked them, telling them to be silent. But they cried out all the more, Lord, have mercy on us, son of David. And stopping, Jesus called them and said, what do you want me to do for you? And they said to him, Lord, let our eyes be opened. And Jesus, in pity, touched their eyes, and immediately they received, recovered their sight and followed him. So there's this deep uh, practical need that draws them to Jesus. He meets that need, and as a result, they, they follow him. And for some people, that's a part of their journey, like, like Art described. Uh, we've, we've looked in the past at some other models that sort of resonate with uh, this idea. So in, in Sky Jathani's book, With, he talked about how um, some of us have a relationship with God that's described as life from God, uh, where maybe we come to God with a need. He meets that need, but we never move past that. We're always just expecting to pull something from God so he can meet our needs, but, but we never develop in our spiritual life or, or journey. So I think Sky Jathani's book with uh, describes uh, some people who are stuck in stage one. And we've talked about Bernard of Clairvaux, who in his book, The Four Degrees of Love, talks about some of the earliest stages in the journey as love of self for self's sake, followed by love of God for self's sake. And in that, that second stage, love of God for self's sake, essentially we're coming to God with needs or desires, expecting uh, to receive them from God but we, we never grow deeper 
in our relationship with God. And we sort of get stuck there. And so, you know, back hundreds of years ago, uh, someone like Bernard of Clairvaux was saying, yeah, it's, it's possible to sort of stay stuck in a, a, a sort of immature relationship with God there at stage one. All right, so we move to stage two from recognition of God to a life of discipleship. This is a time of learning and belonging. In this stage, we learn the most about God as perceived by others we respect and trust. So, so this is a really critical uh, perspective of this stage. We're, we're learning and growing, but it's largely through uh, the people that are, are around us, people that we respect and trust. We're not confident in ourselves to know what to believe or how to learn about God and know God better. We're dependent on a more advanced person in the faith or a guiding principle or a cause to lead us. And so that, that's one of the reasons why they say this stage is, is somewhat external because we're, we're relying on what the church teaches us. We're relying on what Bible teachers teach us. We're relying on what people that are uh, you know, doing the podcasts or writing the books that we read or the people that we follow on, on social media. All, all of that influence is shaping what we uh, come to define as discipleship life with God. So some of the characteristics here, uh, meaning from belonging, being open to friendship and companionship from others on the journey makes a big difference here. So again, community begins to play a big role in this stage. This may take place through a traditionally defined religious community, i.e. a church, or some other relationships. So someone might move into stage two and still not be part of a church or a congregation. It's just They've, they found some like-minded people, and, and together, they're, they're learning more about life with God. Again, answers found in a leader, cause, or belief system. So in stage two, we're depending on a more advanced person in the faith, or a guiding principle, or a cause to lead us. And this is, this is sort of what sets stage two apart from stage five, because in stage five, we, we might make use of uh, other people in the faith, guiding principles or causes, but our growth is more internally motivated and generated in stage five. Number three, a sense of rightness. So in stage two, we assume that the faith we've found and now experience in community is the faith. We trust in its rightness, especially as handed to us by a leader, cause, or belief system. So there, there can be a, a bit of a fundamentalist uh, streak to us in stage two, because uh, we've, we've, we are receiving instruction from those around us, and, and we're just assuming this is, this is right, and it's, it's right for everybody, and if somebody disagrees, then they're not right. Uh, and security in our faith. There is comfort in knowing we do not have to figure out all the answers, but we can trust those who lead us. So again, once again, we're, we're sort of, we're, we're, we're giving up the initiative. We're allowing others to answer the questions for us in stage two, taking comfort in, well, I don't know, but I bet, you know, Bob or Mary knows, and I'm going to ask them. All right, so do, do any of those characteristics show up in your early experiences with God? I would say yes. You want to say more? <laughs> um, I just can relate to those those things that you know. Um, you know, clearly when you I talk about my own conversion, you know, I was in a, a co college community, and you know, there were just opportunities for learning. I was absorbing it uh, just as taught. You know, <laughs> um, I didn't have uh, the ability to go. No, I don't think that makes sense. You know. <laughs> Um, it was very new to me, you know, it was unchurched as well. And then going from there, I went to, I went to sort of a training program to start a church. You know, these are all within a couple of years after my conversion mm. and it was the same kind of thing. Um, and you know, like you said, people you trust and love, um, kind of guide you. 
Yeah. So there's, I mean, there's something natural about that, right? I mean, we're, we're new to the faith. We've, we've got to have some people around us that can help us figure these, these things out. Um, if, if they're good people, then that's a good thing. If, if they're not good people, then it can be a, a bad thing, right? Thank you, Julie. Someone else, any of those characteristics show up in your own early experiences with God? Well, certainly, you know, if you grow up in the church, you you have your parents and other, you know, adult figures that have the answers or whatever, you know, that answer your questions and things like this. And and you 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 go all these things and you begin to have somewhat of a faith, but it's a faith based on the people you trust in life um leading you in the right direction or something you know it's really not your own faith i mean when you talk about faith formation in a in a person growing up in a church or in a church environment or a family of faith you know it it depends a lot on they, they take it you take in a lot of what your parents are now if you have great parents and they answer your questions well and they do really well with that it's wonderful but if if they don't or if they're all into the you know like just just go along and follow rules and don't ask questions or something like that mm -hmm. it, you know you you get a different sense of um of god because your god is is interpreted through these authority figures in your life yeah that's that's really helpful kathy so so a sure uh, signal that you're in a church that's stuck at stage two is what happens when I ask hard questions. Right. Right. Yeah. Because if, if, if it's a church that is cultivating, um, you know, helping people learn to think for themselves, then, then hard questions are welcome. They're part of the culture of the church. But if, if it's a church that's stuck at stage two, we have the answers, we will provide the answers to you. Uh, then anybody that questions those answers is somewhat suspect. But this this model of the spiritual life sees sees the ability to think for yourself as as vital to moving forward. Okay, uh, we're we're it's seven fifty nine, so I feel like that's a good place for us uh, to stop there. So again, most of us have moved through these early stages, and I think that. The takeaway for us would be to continue to consider how do some of these things still shape my life with God, my expectations of life with God. And that can be positive and it can also be negative. So uh, next Wednesday, we'll, we'll jump back into stage two, move on to stage three and possibly stage four. So thank you very much, everybody, for being here tonight. Hope you thank feel you. better. Yes. Thank you very much. Thanks. Feel better. Good night. Good night, everyone.